all, and welcome to Zeke from Home. Today's uh, episode is about the Zeke agent, and it's being hosted by Seth Hall. Uh, Seth, uh, can you take a moment to introduce yourself to those who may not know uh, who you are? Yeah, sure. Uh, former incident responder at The Ohio State University. I, I did incident response for a long time in higher ed and really enjoyed it. Uh, started working with what was then called Bro, now Zeke back in uh, 2005 and uh, got, got hired at the International Computer Science Institute under a National Science Foundation grant to become one of the core developers. And I've been doing that and it, later on we started uh, CoreLight and we've been going with that and CoreLight is now at the point where we're starting to uh, really hire developers and contribute an awful lot back and start moving Zeke forward faster and Zeke Agent actually came out of some of that work. Well, with that, I will let you take the floor and present on the Zeke agent. <clears throat> Sounds good. Thanks, Amber. And thank you for setting up all of, uh, all of this stuff. I know it's, it's not easy to do organization, and it's nice having you around to do it because I'm terrible at it. Well, you're very welcome. <laughs> Uh, so Zeke agent, um, I know that there's, there's been, um, some discussion about it over, uh, the last few weeks because there was the blog post and it's, it's actually publicly released on, um, on, uh, GitHub now. And I know a couple of people have played with it, but I think that there's still some, uh, maybe confusion about what it's for and why it exists. So that's what I was hoping to talk about here is talk about why it exists what the fundamental idea to it is, is as much less about like, you're gonna leave the presentation and be able to write scripts that use it. Uh, it may not be much of a jump beyond that in order, in order to do that, but you're not gonna be able to leave this. This is not like a tutorial on how to uh, really use it. There's also some things that we don't have answered yet in terms of how it'll be deployed and stuff, but we'll get, we'll get to that. So Zeek agent, new thingy. Oops, there. So it really, the, the genesis of this project really comes from this idea of what if a con log looked like this? And I, I highlighted the field that's not real. And there's also a bunch of fields I trimmed out at the bottom. But if a con log looked like that, wouldn't that be kind of cool <laughs> to, uh, if all your con logs were like that, that they just had at that moment in time, just tell me all the users that were logged into the originating host or the responding host in this connection, because um, let's say two, three, six months later, uh, it's gonna be very, very hard in many cases and um, uh, prohibitively expensive to do the query in some cases. Uh, if you wanted to rejoin that data, like let's say you had data of logins and you had data and you had con logs, it'd be very, very difficult to pull that data together in a way where you could get the log this way. But if it's logged up front and, and aggregated together in real time, um, it's just very natural that you put it in the log. And, and at that point you could use grep and you're not actually limited to more uh, uh, improved systems like Splunk or something that can do more uh, complex queries easily. But it's going to have a hard time generally doing that because it's having to look through multiple different data sets to pull things together. Or what if the log looked like this? The originating process is Firefox in this case. Uh, or you could have responding process Nginx or something like that, you know, for whatever it is. But it would be kind of interesting to have a log that looked like that, where you've actually gone far beyond what everyone sort of has viewed Zeek and where Zeek has been positioned mentally for people to say, it sees packets, it creates logs, to suddenly outputting this log, you look at it and you're like, it sees packets and I don't know how it made that log. <laughs> but let's say we would like to make that log. About, uh, someone's gonna correct me on this, maybe, but uh, it, it was about 10 years ago, I believe that OS query came out maybe nine, eight or nine years ago, something like that. Um, I had, at that point, I had already been looking around for quite a while for something. I, I didn't know what I was looking for. I just kept looking for anything that would, uh, anything that would look at host data and, and make it available in a flexible way. Cause I knew what I wanted on, on the Zeek side. I just didn't know what was needed on the other side, on the, the host side. 
And all the host IDS systems, they, they just weren't right because they were like you would write rules and run them on the endpoint and they would like basically send you alerts, but I wasn't looking for alerts, I was looking for data. Um, but OS Query really fit that model well. And I started playing with it the day it was originally released. So just to give background, um, and I'll sort of come back around to why I'm talking about OS Query here too, because we're talking about um, Zeek Agent. But the, uh, the model that OS Query took, and this was what sort of flipped the switch for me mentally, was it treats systems as a database. So select so star from logged in users. And I just ran this on my laptop a little bit ago and I'm logged in. And so you can imagine uh, select star from logged in users gives you uh, this data. And you can also do things like, um, if you see the PID over on the right side, 257, um, you could do a full SQL like join query and join that with the process table and find out what process PID 257 is and get like the argv, so you can see the process name or something like that. So, you know, find out like, is my process I'm running bash or is, is it something else? Or like, what exactly is it? So you, but that's all something that is, um, you just change the query and you, you get the different uh, result set. But, well, let's keep, let's keep moving. I don't wanna dwell on that too much. This goes, there's a lot of these tables built in. I didn't even bother putting them all in here, but I just showed another one. So select star from USB devices. So like that bottom one um, in the, the, the last one, Audio Technica, that's the uh, microphone I'm talking into right now. <laughs> uh, and the Apple LED cinema display, that's the, the, the monitor I'm using right now. Um, so the interesting thing there is that it, the data is all parsed and it is uh, broken into fields and the fields have names starts to feel very familiar in terms of how you think about Zeek. Um, because Zeek has, uh, Zeek has events. And the, this whole integration, we, what we originally started off building, if you were on the uh, call that we had a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, um, I talked about Zeek Agent a little bit. And it came from this idea of saying, let's make a plugin for OS Query. And, um, and then we'll, you know, just sort of integrate with OS Query. What happened was uh, Robin Summer, the lead Zeek developer, and one of the co-founders of Correlate with me, um, he wanted some tables that didn't exist. Like the particular one is that Audis P, um, Audit D integration on Linux. He wanted that because it was the kind of um, evented integration that doesn't exist uh, it's the kind of invented integration that is just not there right now on um, in, on OS Query. And um, he, he wanted that. And so what happened was you think of like this, this idea that OS Query is sitting there and it's talking, sorry, Zeek Agent is sitting there and it's talking to OS Query, but Zeek Agent is what's talking to Zeek. And if, uh, if it knows it needs to run a query and it knows the tables that it needs to run on, it just runs against those tables directly. So there are some tables integrated, uh, implemented directly in Zeek Agent, uh, like the Audis P and the um, Apple Endpoint Security one, which I have not played with yet because we don't have the signing correct so that we can actually access that API. Uh, Mac OS X denies us access to that API right now because we don't have the binaries signed yet. That's coming eventually. Um, so the really the the real point here though is that that bottom um, the bottom one. There's there's a mode to OS query where it will run a query and um, it it when that query results that changes right. So let's go back to uh, back to here. So let's say no one's logged into a system and I do select star from logged in users. That result set is, is nothing. There's, there's no results. And then someone logs in like, like, you know, me. So suddenly that result set has changed. A new row is added to it. And what's happening is always query is just running this query regularly. Like every, it's configurable. You can define it when you define the query, but it's configurable. So let's say it runs it every 10 seconds. So I log in. A few seconds later, it runs the query, finds out the result set now has an item in it. Um, if you look at this, and if you're familiar with writing Zeek scripts, this is gonna look really familiar because suddenly look at these as an event where you have 
like over here to the left, you would have like a uh, an event name, and then you would have parameter one, a field called type, and then you'd have a field called user, and then you'd have a field called TTY, and a field called host, and a field called time, and a field called PID. And suddenly, that's an event. I mean, that's like a directly an event in Bro. This was what sort of what, uh, lit the light bulb for me because suddenly I looked at that and I was like, oh my gosh, these are Zeek events. Sorry, I said Bro there too. So that was a slip. So we've ended up, ah, uh, Matthias, let's, let's see if, hey, I hope I said that right. Well, let, let me click the button on you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, that works Perfect. really well. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Um, you mentioned Apple and Linux, and I remembered in uh, the last seminar, I briefly asked about Windows, and I was interested in, have there been any further developments in terms of integration toward Windows, perhaps with Sysmon or something like that? Yeah, I, I don't, I, I know that there was, I, I'm, I'm not familiar yet. I haven't, uh, I haven't done a lot of, um, development on the core of Zeek Agent. I've mostly been working on the scripts where we've had uh, other people working on the core. And I thought there had been some initial work on that, but then it turns out there may not have been. I, I'm a little unclear what the state on that is, but that's certainly work to be done. I mean, it, it absolutely makes sense that we would make this work uh, on some native capability in Windows or, or integrate with like Windows Defender or something like that. To, to get the same data because tables like select star from logged in user, um, you know, there's no real fundamental reason we have to go through OS query to get that information. Um, we could do it directly ourselves and find out what it is. So it could be that, you know, OS yeah. query has 150 tables, but we really, there's like 10 that are really, really interesting for Zeek and we implement yeah. those 10. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that happening, but there's no action on it right now that I'm aware of. Okay, perfect, thanks. I would also love to have that happen though. <laughs> so what I wanted to talk about next is, uh, is um, how Zeek Agent is different from existing agents because it is called Zeek Agent. And one thing I've noticed though, is that it, it kind of is, it's not, I mean, it's not like a, a world changing difference, but it's different enough to point out. Uh, the idea generally is that uh, each agent as it starts up, all it knows is to go and connect to your, your Zeek infrastructure. You don't need to tell it anything else. Maybe you wanna give it um, the IP address and port it's supposed to connect to. You can set up, um, this was added to it recently. You can configure certificates and things to set up so that it, you're doing by default, it does, it's encrypted with SSL without certificates, but um, you can change that so that it does use certificates. I, I don't fully know off the top of my head how to do that, but you can and make it more secure. Um, and, and then the actual functionality that you implement is implemented through, um, is implemented through Zeek scripts that you load on the Zeek side. And so you can imagine if you write a new script and load it, you, you restart Zeek on the sort of centralized server side, and then all the Zeek agent processes will get disconnected and then they'll reconnect and then they'll pull those new queries that you've, you've told them to. Um, and eventually this is where it starts to get really cool because eventually you're gonna have people publishing Zeek agent scripts to the Zeek package repository. And you can just say, well, you know, here's a script that adds some information, uh, adds, oops, here's a script that adds some information to the con log, or here is something that, uh, you know, adds a little bit of extra context to the uh, HTTP log, or here is one that is collecting information across a number of systems, and it's creating some aggregate log about your sort of like fleet behaviors, like you've got 500 laptops connecting in and you want to kind of get a feel for what they're all doing or, or outliers there. So you could certainly write scripts that collect information from lots of them and look for outliers and behavior among your, your set of laptops that you have out there running this. Oh, and I see there's a chat thing. I didn't see that before. Okay. Sorry, this is uh, all of this is new. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so I wanted to show just a little bit about how this works because I think it's really um, substantial uh, from a from a user perspective because you can actually kind of get a sense for like why this is flexible and, and how it works. Um, so first of all, you have to register a query. So from the when you're writing a Zeek script, it you typically in Zeek in it. Um, you would write one of these uh, query, subscribe queries. You can do on-demand queries, like if you want to go to a particular host and say, run this query right now and then get the result back, you can do that as well. I, I haven't done that before, so I'm not sure off the top of my head how to do it. What I'm mostly interested in is these ones where you're getting, you're really looking for like a, a stream of data. So you're saying when um, users on a system have changed. So I'm doing select, uh, selecting from the users table. You can see on that query line uh, here over on the right. So you're selecting UID signed, group ID signed, username, description, directory shell from users. So you get all this information. These, the, the fields that you've defined here are going to be the fields in your event where, when you're getting this data back. And you're really just saying, if someone changed something about a user, they change the, the shell for a user that you're gonna get an event for that. If they um, add a user, you'll get an event for that. If they change the description for a user, the, you know, delete a, or add a new user or delete a user or whatever, you'll get events for all of those. Um, which, you know, by itself, like a, one, like a, a single event on a single in machine is kind of interesting, but getting this on a large fleet of systems could be massively interesting and especially if you can start correlating it with other network traffic and stuff if you're seeing behaviors there you can like mark points in time and, and do all sorts of weird stuff that is a little unexpected so the select line you typically are not going to do select star because these fields have to map directly to an event that is auto created so this uh the event is in the line above the uh, dollar sign EV, you're defining what event. When the, when the data comes back from this, that's the event I want to go to. So it's uh, module agent users um, event name change. So here's the event handler. So there's this uh, special field that gets added at the beginning that is a record similar to like the connection record. This is the Zeek agent result record. And it tells you some information about like what host is this coming from, um, what kind of result is it? Is it an add or a delete or, or is it one of the initial data sets? items or something like that. And then you've got your user ID, group ID, username, description, directory, and shell, which is exactly what we had in the query. And then all I'm doing here is doing print username. But it's interesting because this is scalable and you could have a lot of systems connect into you and just print usernames being, I guess in this case, it's kind of silly because this could be added or deleted or whatever. But that's it, like that's the whole thing. And then the question suddenly becomes, this adds potentially infinite new events to Zeek that, that you can collect and host information from. Um, just with those, you know, these two little things, you subscribe to a query, you handle the result set, that's it. You could subscribe also, this, I don't wanna say like, you're limited here to, dis, to subscribe in a, in a script that you're writing, you could subscribe to four different tables, have event handlers for all of those, merge data between them to look for, for bigger patterns or to look for behaviors that are weird across hosts, things like that. So this is, is very kind of open-ended what you do with it. The way this is gonna look eventually, this, is, this we're pretty unclear on because like right now we don't have the ability to run a specialized node using like Zeek control. We don't have the ability right now in Zeek control to run a specialized node that Zeek agent connects into. And there's been some discussion too about wanting to um, have some routing and stuff so that maybe you're not talking, whoops, so that maybe you're not talking directly to a Zeek process. You're talking to a, uh, you're, you're potentially talking to a, uh, the idea would be that you're potentially talking to like um, an, an event router or something that is a not a full Zeek process, but actually just a really cut down um, broker, the uh, Zeek communication protocol, a right? really cut down broker process. Um, so what would happen is you'd run your Zeek cluster and it would have what everyone is familiar with, like a manager and a logger and proxies and workers and everything. 
and you would load your Zeek agent script into there, or Zeek agent scripts, because you can you can load a number of them too. Um, and packets, you'd feed off a network tap or however you're getting packets, and they would go in your Zeek cluster. And then your Zeek cluster would have these Zeek agent processes that are running on servers or laptops or desktops or whatever. And they connect in and whatever Zeek agent scripts you've loaded are then sending queries out to all those Zeek agents when they connect in to say, hey, these are the queries I want you to run. And then data starts coming back. And at that point, just the same in your Zeek cluster, you've got, you know, um, uh, connection established event well, maybe you also have that uh, that agent host, wh whatever that event was that we had up here, agent users change, right? That's also an event you have. And they just happen to be coming from different places. One comes from network traffic, one comes from um, end hosts. And then you just write your script and you jumble the data around and, and it dumps logs out. So I wanted to stop for just a second and see if there are any questions. Uh, if you, if anyone would like to talk, feel free to raise your hand and I will unmute you. I see the question in chat, that, but I'm, I'm not sure what the context is about um, like Security Onion. Hey, Nick, you are unmuted. Yeah, so it sounds like the plan is, there's gonna be some correlation here too. So the UID that's generated by um, the con log, for example, we should expect to see the same UID from an agent log. I was just curious what that might um, look like because there's there. I mean, there would be timing issues and there is a lot of unknowns still. <laughs> there is this is going to be a lot of discovery over time. So we're not we're not totally sure. Um, I, I don't think anyone can say this yet. And feel free to raise your hand if anyone is sure of or has some idea of how this is going to work. But uh, how exactly to tie together a Zeek agent to something seen on the network? I mean, we're likely going to have to like run a query against Zeek agent or make, maybe make Zeek agent support this natively so that they can say like, here's the IP address that I'm at. You, you know, just say like, I, I'm at this IP address. Another thing that I could possibly see doing is even having Zeek agent send some traffic out that is basically a beacon, a noticeable beacon, so that you basically you're trying to tie together like Zeek agent poking this thing at the internet with something that you're gonna be able to see in network traffic so that Zeek can tie them together and say, aha, I've identified this host sent this thing with this you know random token and I picked it up on the network. So these are now tied together. I like that's, that's this host. Uh, I, I don't know what that's going to look like yet. Yeah. Uh, just, oh, and I, I see the, 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 the yeah, I know. It doesn't sound like a trivial problem, right? It, it's, I, I don't think it is a trivial problem. I, I do see that uh, Jeff, Jeff, uh, sorry, Jeff Collier asked about um, Nat, Nat will make IP based lookup hard, lookups hard, which is also why this notion of doing the, uh, the sending the, the, the connection doing doing something on the network that is identifiable could be nice because if someone is running Zeek agent and they're sitting behind that you'll still find it because as long as the thing goes out to the internet and you're monitoring before it goes to the internet it, it'll be able to pick that up and do the correlation so anyway lots of room to explore stuff this is what's so exciting about this project to me is there's so much room to get involved with um defining how it works because it's kind of unknown. I mean, especially doing this at a, at large scale, no one knows how it's going to work. But, uh, oh, Fatima, I saw that you, did you still want to say something? <laughs> but yes, Jeff, uh, I, I, I have been thinking about Nat for quite a while with this and I, I was just not sure how this was going to work yet. I haven't done a lot of correlation with this yet so I hadn't thought through it much but considering that everyone's sitting at home right now that notion of like how do you identify where anything is was really weighing on me because if it asked if we ran a query on Zeek agent and said you know what's your IP address it's going to give me the IP address of my laptop which does me zero good because I'm never going to see that traffic but honestly if we're if like in Correlate, 
we're monitoring our cloud infrastructure and I connect to something in our cloud infrastructure, I think it'd be kind of cool if it just automatically identified that, you know, that's me at that, that, you know, IP address. Um, Fatima says, I wanted to add on the IP address being a key for correlation, getting the MAC addresses in the Zeek logs would be cool. That's the thing. There's a million directions to go with this thing. <laughs> and yes, Fatima, I think that you're really hitting on the point that there are so many directions to go with this. Some of the stuff to help, uh, to, to help the correlation for endpoints to network traffic, that's something I think that we're going to really have to, to add support in Zeek Agent and in the Zeek Agent, like the, the framework that likely will eventually get integrated into Zeek proper. Um, we're just going to have to add better support there for, for doing that type of stuff. But um, yeah, it's, it's sort of unknown what that's going to look like so far. Although now after talking about it, I'm really this notion of doing the, uh, the basically the, making Zeek agent ping out to the internet for sending some knowable token would be interesting for, uh, for correlation. You can really identify where all your stuff is on the network without having to, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of directions to go with this. Uh, oh, I see Matthias put his hand up. Yeah, okay. just a yeah, question. You um, yeah, perfect. A, a question in terms of this. So whenever you do something, the idea is to reach out to the Seek agent. So the idea isn't to make sure you always have all the logs from the Seek agent locally on the Seek cluster. It's only on ad hoc needed basis. Uh, well, the, the idea is that Zeek agent is a persistent connection to Zeek. So for one, Zeek agent connects out to Zeek. So it, it does go that way because generally going the other way is not going to make much sense for having like your Zeek cluster know where all these endpoints are, reach out to them, especially because many times you're going to end up with laptops like in a coffee shop behind a mat and it's just not practical to do that. Um, yeah. But they, they are a uh, lie. The, the idea is that this is... Um, live behavioral detection. And so it is really pretty heavily organized around the idea of uh, persistent connections ongoing and not like check-in based. There has been some discussion though around like, like yeah, I, I, uh, I was actually thinking more in terms of where the data resides normally. So it would only be when you actually need something that you would have the data from the uh, laptop being pushed towards the C cluster or being pulled towards the C cluster and not just continuously having everything like a mini CM system or something like that. Record everything like in carbon black or something like that, get it into the C cluster and then you can do a lot quicker automation and have all data there and look over tables because then you would quickly be able to correlate this process initiated this time, talk to this IP address on the external side, uh, it was this owner and so on. And, and you wouldn't yeah. need necessarily to to ask all of them all the time. Um, yeah, so we, we didn't, this isn't, um, there's not really much done on the agent side. The agent side just receives queries and it's told what to do. And then as it has data that it needs to send, it sends it. It's, it's pretty yeah. straightforward and simple. There's, there's just not much. And then because Zeek is the programming language and the, the sort of data environment, all the data comes immediately back to, to the cluster and is analyzed there. Yeah. So but there is a local cache points. on the Seek agent, right? So for what example, do you mean, what do you mean by that? I mean, for example, that when a process executes on the Seek agent, um, or a, when a process executes on a laptop, it will start and then go down five seconds later. So you will record that and save it locally. So when I query one minute later, because I need the information, it will still have that saved. So I actually get the information, right? Or will I then create the query, for example, saying, which process did uh, talk to this IP address? Oh, no process talk to that IP address right now. So I don't get the information at all. So I'm guessing or hoping at least that there is some kind of local cache in saying this happened in the, in the last there's, five minutes. There's, nothing, there's minutes. nothing smart going on on the Zeek agent side. <laughs> it's, okay. it's because a lot of times most of your things are going to be pre-queries, pre right? Like, Maybe, let's say, for instance, you want to know about every connection that a host is making. So you do select star from whatever. So I don't know how this would work exactly. Like on Linux, you might use the uh, Audisp, AudiSpD. This is the worst name, Damon. Mm -hmm. AudiSpD, the, the Audit D integration. 
even though actually I now that I say that I completely forgot to add into the, the thing um, the the developer uh, for Zeke agent had also added uh, I think I don't know if it's there yet or not he was working on eBPF integration so that you'd be able to do eBPF queries queries using eBPF on the back end so you could do things like that but what would happen is is you wouldn't dynamically go out to Zeek agent and say hey what connection is going on you would at startup time when Zeek agent initially connects into your Zeek cluster you'd have a Zeek a script that then says hey run this query with it would be like you know select star from connections or something I, I don't know it's made up but then uh, Zeek agent, every time a new connection starts, it would send an event to say, hey, a connection started. So it's, it's less about this like dynamic back and forth and more okay. about this like every time this stuff happens, let me know. Okay. So that's, that's mostly what it's organized around. You can do on-demand queries, but you're immediately going to start running into problems like you just intimated. The, yeah. You know, this, this idea of not knowing because it's already done and you can't query it when it's done. But and that, generally, okay, so, there's not so much basically, smart. yeah. So sorry. So so basically, I have yeah. all the overview of all the process that's ever run on the machine already available in the C cluster in a log file. Right. Well, and okay. it doesn't even necessarily have to be in a log file. You can on the Zeek side, you can have it stay in memory. And so, if you're never writing like you know the full recording of all that stuff out, it could just be you maintain it for. <clears throat> a short period of time in um, in memory or in a, uh, uh, a data store, which is a newer thing in Zeek, and you know you can maintain it that way. So there is the ability to um, to play a lot of games, I guess, because once you get it into Zeek, the Zeek cluster, what we've been doing for years is organized around like how do you analyze infinite data and and be effective with that. So there's a lot of structures around like remembering data for a short period of time and then automatically cleaning it up and things like that. So it fits well in, into that architecture. But I'm sure lots of people will start playing with this over the next few months. Definitely, um, thanks. Yeah, no problem. So I figured I would just go through, I'm just, this is not gonna take long. It's just a couple of examples. Um, and then I'm good to, to hang out for the next 25 minutes after that if people wanna talk. But uh, this, and I figured Amber could maybe paste this to, to chat or something in here. Uh, if people want to follow along, these are, these, these examples I was going to go through, I just ran these on my laptop a little bit ago, pasted some logs so you could get an idea. If you want to see the scripts they're coming from, there's the URL that the, uh, the scripts are available at. And these are all using OS query tables. They're not using any of the built-in tables. So this is me running. OS query on my laptop, running uh, Zeek agent on my laptop with the doing the OS query plugin model, and then running Zeek with those scripts that you see. So it is a little bit complicated, <laughs> unfortunately, but you know, it's how it is right now. So this is running on my laptop. Um, I discovered that Zoom keeps opening and closing UDP ports. <laughs> you can see the, the first line in the log there. And sorry, these are in the traditional, I'll, I'm using air quotes you can't see, traditional uh, Zeek tab separated log format. So you'll just have to sort of excuse the uh, difficult reading, but you can see the field names are up at the top and you'll just have to correlate those. But you can see like at the end of each line is the process name. So process name is uh, just the, the name, basically the argv name that you would see the, in, in what you'd see in top or something. So it looks like uh, at some time earlier today, Zoom, um, you can see it says closed, that first log line, um, closed, uh, the closed its port, listening on my local IP address, which you can see there. Um, and what was it? Port uh, 53176. And it was PID 32111. And the process name was zoom.us. And then the next line, I ran netcat-l12345 just to get netcat to, um, uh, just to get netcat to listen. And you can see that I started it up. It said I listened on 0000, zero, zero, zero so it was going to open on, on from, from anything. Uh, it opened 12345, and then I, I, I hit control C on it and closed it a few minutes later. 
Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the whole thing. Two of the, the things you can see here that we're still trying to kind of wrap our heads around are the host and host name fields. You can see that big UUID, or I guess maybe this is GUID, but you can see this, that big field. That's a, a field that uniquely identifies my laptop. I, it's taking some data from the host and it's, it's doing some stuff to like identify my laptop. I believe if I close the process and reopen it, I get that same UUID. And then you can see my laptop is named Blake. So it's called Blake.local is the, the host name, but that's you know driven by whatever the user types in or whatever is configured on an enterprise management thing. So anyway, this is, this is not tying together network traffic at all. This is purely like watching for ports that open and close locally. And, and I am, um, I did do one thing in this script. And if you look at the script, you can see it. Uh, the query itself is limiting it to um, only, it, it ignores stuff where the address is 127.0.0.1. So I'm, the script itself is ignoring ports that are open listening to loop back. Because from, like, as an example, maybe in this script, you really only care about stuff that potentially is going to be available outside of the machine itself. If I listen on 127.0.0.1, no one from, off my, from outside of my machine can connect to that service. So do I care or is it just extra data? I don't know. It depends on what your goal is. Uh, but in this case, I'm only trying to do things that may expose themselves on the network in some way. So in, you can see, you know, there were probably tons of things opening and closing loopback stuff, but these are things that are, that are available outside of the machine, assuming the firewall is allowing it, but they can be allowed outside of the machine. Uh, in this one, um, this, it, this one is just logging uh, users. So this is a little misleading because it looks like I added this user to my machine even though the user was already here. What the script is not doing is getting rid of the initial data set. Right now, Zeek Agent sends the initial data set along with everything. Ideally, eventually, we'll be able to have that as an option where we can say, don't send the initial data set. I am, uh, don't, like, don't send the initial data set. I, I'm not interested in users that are already there. I just want to know about systems that are adding at this point in time, adding new users or deleting users. And it has, you know, user ID, group ID, username, shell, stuff like that. I mean, you're also going to get an event here. If, um, like, for instance, I changed my shell, there would be an event for that. And it, it would be, I believe that would end up in an event. I need to play with that some, but yeah, that, that should give me an event to say, hey, you know, something's different. Um, and then uh, I just took a, <laughs> I took a, a micro SD card and plugged it into, plugged it in and then yanked it back out and got those two long lines. So this is the um, mounts script, which is interesting. I mean, you know, if nothing else, this is finding out people plugging in thumb drives into systems or mounting external drives and all kinds of stuff. From a security perspective, it's all in play. It's all game. I mean, I could totally see catching changes in behavior or just all sorts of weird stuff from external drives being mounted. I mean, I could totally even imagine like an attacker getting onto someone's laptop and, you know, remote mounting some drive over the network and doing stuff. But I, I don't want to say an attacker wouldn't do that. <laughs> so this just shows where the, in, in granted, there's more information that could be put in this log, but like many of the Zeke scripts, we try to um, be careful about what we're logging. And in this case, the script is just really an example script. It's in the examples directory. Uh, all it's doing is logging the path and, and if it's a, a new mount or an unmount. Um, because, you know, by itself, that's interesting. That You also have other information, like what kind of file system is it, a bunch of other stuff. But uh, that's pretty much the whole question. I am completely available. If people want to talk for 20 minutes or ask questions, I would love to have all sorts of thought experiments or whatever you guys are up for. So thanks, have, for uh, thanks for coming. We have a couple questions in the Q&A, if you'll look in the, in oh. the Q&A. Oh. Many places to look. I don't know much at all about Okta. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know what answer live means. You would like to, okay. All right. Uh, so the, the question was, are there any are there any discussions with Okta? Uh, no. Um, if 
Terry, if you would like to talk and provide more context around your question, I, you can totally, uh, you can raise your hand and I'll click the button. But uh, otherwise, I, I just, I, I know that they are a single sign-on provider. Other than that, I don't know much about, about them. Uh, and the other question, also from Terry, was Zeke Agent does asynchronous broadcast. I don't think I fully understand that question either. Um, so I don't see a hand being raised. Um, I think uh, Nick had another question, if I saw correctly. I, I just posted it in the in the uh, Slack channel, but uh, we've. I'm super interested in this. This seems so exciting to me. I mean, I know it's early development, but um, we're definitely interested in the Windows porting as well. And I know Seth earlier in the presentation said he wasn't sure uh, if that's being worked on or not. So I, I really just broadcasted that question. It goes anybody actually looking at at that. So. Yeah, I, I am super excited because I know that there are so many organizations. I mean, I haven't run Windows personally for about 20 years, but I think I have to soon once we have some integration there. But um, yeah, the, the idea of, I don't know, something about, something about the way this works is so appealing to me with the fact that uh, you can, I, I hope it works out that we can really start effectively creating, it, it's almost like a, a sensor network in some sense, like you've got data you're collecting from end hosts and from servers because Zeek Agent runs just fine on servers too. That was where Robin originally started uh, playing with stuff. Um, and, and that's what we've been, we've been running into is, I mean, is, you know, we've got an extensive Zeek and Corelight deployment and it's like, oh, we've got so much valuable data on the network, but we've got nothing that we can connect to from the host side other than yeah. having, to, having to deploy a bunch of odds and ends tools or other vendors that don't connect, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it, I, I, this model, the, the way that this whole thing works with the queries that are defined in scripts and the, the endpoints don't need to know anything and you can load scripts that other people wrote, it just, it, it just, it feels right. Like it feels like the right model for doing a lot of this. I mean, it was really similar. I found a presentation that I did in 2007 to a, a group of higher ed incident response teams. And I was basically making the case that um, at the time Bro was, uh, was something that all of the universities that I was talking to, it was about 10 of 10, it was basically the US, in the US, there's a group called the Big 10 and which is mostly viewed as a sports thing, but it's also other parts of the universities as well. And we all would get together four times a year. And I made this presentation to say, hey, we should all run Bro because it gives us the ability to share functionality where before everyone was just, I think this is a long time ago, hacking up Perl scripts or Python scripts or something that would like analyze data and you could never share any of it because it was very specific to like, oh, well, we capture NetFlow in OSU Flow Tools format and we capture NetFlow in NSN or we have some commercial product or something. And I was making the case that like, look, we, what if we write these scripts in Bro and then we can give them to the other universities and everyone can get that same benefit because it's sort of like a level playing ground. And I think that this might be something similar for, uh, for, for host information. And it's just sort of a, convenient side effect that you may be able to correlate that with network traffic. And I have no idea if this is all going to work out or not, but uh, so far it's pretty exciting. Oh, and I see there are questions and things. Is there a potential to get visibility into east-west traffic from Zeek agent that your Zeek sensor placement may not have visibility into? Well, um, keep in mind that uh, well, I, okay, I'll start off by saying yes. <laughs> uh, but keep in mind that Zeek Agent is really much more about monitoring end host data and not network traffic, granted. That said, you could, you know, every time a network connection is established or shut down, you could send events over to Zeek. So you can get something 
you can get something similar to that, right? Like you could get, uh, you could create something that looks kind of like a con log over on the Zeek side that is purely based on uh, endpoint data. I, I don't know if that's going to be effective or I, I don't know. I, I just, I just don't know, know much there. It, it may actually work pretty well, but again, it could be in some environments it works, in some environments it doesn't just because the sheer volume of data that might be coming from some end hosts. But if you're at, the, the cool part here is that it wouldn't be functionality that is necessarily native to Zeek agent. It would just be a script that someone wrote and, and loaded, like, you know, the ability to write out like an agent con log or something like that. Um, that would totally be doable. And in some environments, it may work totally fine where you just have this extra con log that was collected completely from end hosts. But the, the thing there that's so exciting to me is that um, it's not inherently built in. It's something that you can just write a script and get that functionality uh, dynamically or ad hoc or whatever word you want to use there. And I see the comment about this looks similar to Tanium. I do not know enough about Tanium to, <laughs> to even comment on that. Oh, I see another question. Can you please let us know the integration process with Endpoint? Um, that's kind of the, the unknown right now. Um, if you want to play with it, what I would recommend is going to the Zeek agent, um, go to the Zeek agent page on GitHub and there's directions on getting it deployed. And I followed the, when I started working with it, I didn't know anything. I just followed the directions and, and got it going pretty easily. It's a few hiccups, but not really too bad. Um, and it's just basically you run a Zeek process using that. So you run Zeek on, the same system or another system, loading the Zeek agent framework, and then tell your, your other one to connect to that, or tell your Zeek agent system to, to connect to the other system. It's, uh, that's pretty much it. But then the problem right now is there's just not really any functionality. There's those example scripts sitting there, but there's not, there's no one out there right now that is like doing incident response with this. It's just not there right now. Maybe by the end of the year, it'll be there. And, and we don't, we really don't have a deployment model. Like I showed in the, like, whoops, like I showed in this slide, we just don't have this deployment model. We, we kind of have an idea of what this is going to look like, but the tooling and stuff is just not there yet. Um, so every, anything you do right now is a little bit manual. Like you may not run a Zeek cluster. You may just run a Zeek process and have Zeek agent connect into it but then you're unlikely to have network traffic flowing into that Zeek process. I mean, you could, but uh, it wouldn't be scalable. So yeah, there, there's a lot to go, but we're, we're really excited. We're looking forward for people playing with this and trying it. We've got about 10 minutes left. If anybody has any more questions uh, for Seth, uh, we'll be on the call. Um, and we're so glad that everyone joined today. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I like people. I like uh, the questions and stuff. And it'll be fun. I, I can't wait to start seeing scripts show up. That's one thing that's really exciting for me. I need to make scripts show up too. <laughs> more, more than are there already. My, the ones that I've written were really just modified from some of the ones that other people wrote. This has passed through several hands. Uh, there's, there was a research student in, uh, uh, there was a research student in Germany that really kicked this off by making an early prototype. Oh, there was a question. Can you speak to what the Audit D extension adds in terms of capabilities? Everything that Audit D produces is accessible to the Zeek agent. Uh, I have not played with it enough. <laughs> uh, I ran the I ran the audit D stuff on a server that I run for a while, but um, it ended up causing performance problems for me, as is the sort of normal adage with uh, with 
with Audit V. Um, at, at least I think, it, as far as I could tell, it was causing performance problems. The server seemed to run slower when I had Audit D on, and then I turned it off, and it got better. Um, in terms of capabilities, I believe it does have access to to everything from Audit D. You just have to there, there's instructions on how to configure Audit D in the um, the Zeek agent documentation, sort of the, like the Zeek agent readme. There is a description there for how to do it. Um, what I'm not familiar with is the tables that it gives you. But actually, now that I think about it, um, if you look at this page, the, the URL here, do you see at the end of it, it says examples OS query. If you take off the OS query, there is another directory of um, audit D. So there, are, I think, I'm pretty sure the directory is called audit D. So there's examples audit D. That will show you some of the queries that you can do. Um, I don't think I really did anything on those queries. But I think it was maybe Robin that wrote those scripts originally. And I didn't really do anything except sort of reformat them and sort of insubstantially in, in change them. Uh, but yeah, there, there are examples. I, I would look at that. So that's maybe, that's maybe what I'm getting at is take a look at the examples for Audit D. Eventually, we'll have examples for um, when we get the signing key from uh, Apple, we'll be able to get uh, examples for like the Mac OS X integration so you can see what those tables look like. And at some point, maybe we'll have examples of, uh, we'll have examples of uh, Windows once we have functionality there. Yeah, I, I, that performance issues thing, I really, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was I was doing other stuff on the server and it felt like that other stuff was going slower and then it felt like it was going faster but I really didn't spend much time measuring it or anything to find out if that was just me being wrong or what exactly it was and I went with the the problem was I went with as you indicated everyone always notices performance problems with audit dean so I just assumed that was it but not totally sure anyway seems like things are sort of petering out, but I, I did really want to say thank you to everybody for coming. These, I, I don't know if this is the first Zeke at Home event, Amber, is it? Or it is. Oh, it is the, the first one, yeah. yeah. Well, I will say Zoom works great for this and it was, it was a lot of fun being able to get questions and have, be able to have people raise their hand and stuff so easily. That was very, very nice. And for those of you that are on the call, um, we did post a blog post uh, over on Zeek.org slash blog about uh, Zeek from Home. So if you've ever presented on Zeek at Zeek Week or a BroCon, or if you've uh, helped us with workshops or anything like that, and you have Zeek related content that you would like to present in one of these Zeek from Homes, please let me know um, and we'll follow up and we'll get you scheduled. The, the only caveat is it can't be a marketing product or sales pitch, but all of you uh, know the technical sides of what you're working with uh, and as users, what other users might like to, to know about. So think about that. Uh, and if you want to present, let me know and we'll get you scheduled. So thank you so much. Thank you, Seth, for presenting and thank you all uh, for your questions and for participating. And uh, I will follow up with an email after this with all the links and everything that uh, Seth referenced today. So thank you so much and have a great day.